better? Hello, hello. If I talk down like this, does this work? Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, better. All right, so, aw, thanks. Um, so I am really happy to be back. Um, I'm not exactly sure how many conferences I have attended, but I think I'm up, I think this is about 10 years um, that I've attended the conferences. Um, when I first started attending, um, I used to talk about head halters, you know, at night when everyone was drinking. <laughs> how well do you think that went over? <laughs> Not well, <laughs> um, because it was tools that people weren't necessarily understanding, um, and I was always struggling to try and explain how this tool could be so effective. Um, so ideally, I can't believe after all these years, I actually get to stand in front of you know this entire organization. I, really? Because it sounds like I'm not good. <laughs> I know. Okay, thanks. Yeah, can I get some reverb up in here? All right. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to present this. Uh, yeah. Um, to be able to present this because, you know, so many years ago I had so many people telling me um, what a horrible tool this was. And I knew different, and I saw different, and my clients saw different. Um, so I have built almost an entire business. Um, raise your hand if you're here and you work for me or have worked for me. There you go. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. So basically, well, staff-wise, but you know, Kyle, he's worked with me at TCW. Um, but um, I've built an entire business around this, not necessarily this tool, but the mindset that it creates. So I'm really excited to hopefully, um, if you guys are head halter haters, welcome. Um, you know, this will be a, this will be a good one. Raise your hand if you're a head halter hater. Okay. All right. Raise your hand if you just don't know. Okay, just don't know, just don't understand. Okay, great. Well, I'm hoping that either way, I might be able to get you guys um, just to maybe start thinking about it. Because how many people relate to the, the, uh, the concept of balance trainer? Right? Balance trainer? That doesn't mean that you don't use, you use everything but head halters. Right? Balance trainer means you use everything. Okay, so I want to show you how effective this tool can be um, in your lives and also for your clients. I will tell you, they will thank you. All right, they will definitely thank you. So first and foremost, I want to tell you a little story about this dog in this picture. Um, I talk about her a lot just because she meant a lot to me um, and still does. Don't worry, she's still alive. Um, <laughs> but this is a dog. Her name is Tina Louise. Um, and I first met Tina in September of 2009. Um, is Blake in here? Is Blake Rodriguez in here? He was talking about, um, he was talking about uh, the Katrina rescue. Yeah, she was a Katrina rescue. Um, so yeah, she was a Katrina rescue um, uh, and was at Best Friends Animal Society. Um, they invited me um, back to their training partners program. And when I say they invited me back, um, I will tell you we had a big disconnect when it came down to the first time that they attempted to do this training partners program and I applied for the program, um, they actually denied me. That really sucked because I had actually fostered for them since 1995. I had fostered probably over 100 dogs from the sanctuary through my home. Um, and I had also managed and run their, um, as a volunteer, their um, pet adoption center in uh, Northern Salt Lake. So it was kind of one of those things where I was like, wow, what a, what a painful existence that all of a sudden we didn't connect anymore because I had moved more into training and I had opened up kind of what I was doing. So their perception of my training didn't fall in line anymore with what they were doing, with what their, their morals are. Does anybody, do, do you guys know where Best Friends is or what Best Friends is? Best Friends Animal Sanctuary slash Society now? Um, so uh, that stung a lot. So this was an opportunity. I did get invited back. Um, There's this great guy that was working there that had come and worked with me and had saw what I had, you know, what I was doing um, with the socials. Um, also working with the head halter, um, and he kind he knew better. So he was the one who kind of encouraged best friends to have me come back. So I'm at the sanctuary, and I meet this dog Tina. So they bring her out, you know, I kind of agree, all right, we're going to take her out, uh, I'll take her for an overnight, and you can do that with a lot of the dogs at the sanctuary. And so they bring her out, and by the way, she was an original Katrina rescue, you guys, this was in 2009, she had been there for five years. She had been there for five years. The reason she had been there for five years is because she was ragingly dog aggressive. They could not introduce her to any dogs. So what happened 
is they go and they're like, oh yeah, we'll get her out. Um, has anyone been to Best Friends? Watch the TV show? Okay, so Dogtown, basically what it looks like is there's a road kind of going down and then there's um, runs that go out. So there's buildings with runs where the dogs can just come in and out of the buildings all day long. And so as you start to walk down the roads, the dogs start coming to the fences and they're barking and doing all their things. Um, this is where a lot of the um, big dogs were. So, um, so they bring her out. And I was shocked to say they should have had a chair and a whip because it was more like taming a lion. <laughs> okay, they bring her out, um, and she has on a, like a faded green harness with a back clip, and there are two uh, trainers handling her with chain leashes, one on each side. Okay, so as they start walking her down this aisle. Am I going to be okay with the sound? As they start walking her down this aisle, the one is holding the leash, and they're holding it so tight, okay? They start walking her down the aisle, and the dogs start coming out, and the dogs start fence fighting, and she starts biting up the leash, right? She goes crazy, starts biting up the leash. So right as she gets to the other one's hand, or almost gets to it, the other person starts pulling, okay, to get her to switch to the other side. So then she starts attacking the other leash. And I was just like, oh, damn, we do have a problem on our hands. So, but as a dog trainer, what was I thinking? I can fix that. <laughs> you know, I can fix that. So um, that's basically um, what got me into working with Tina. Um, and so I spent the night with her. But because of all the red tape and because they didn't trust me, Okay, they didn't trust me. They thought I was going to shock her. They thought I was going to whip her. They thought I was going to do all these horrible things to her. So it actually took me a year before they actually allowed me to foster her. And how that happened is after about nine months, her kennel mate died. Uh-oh, now they can't introduce her to any other dogs. She's taking up an entire kennel. At this facility, most of their animals are living in pack of dogs. There's usually three or four dogs in each run. Right? And they can't put her with that. So now my phone's ringing. Hey, Heather, do you guys honestly think I needed to take this dog? No. <laughs> no. But, you know, of course, my history with best friends, I wanted a way back in. You know, I wanted to show them that I didn't have to use and I wasn't using what they considered abusive techniques to work with a difficult and aggressive dog. Okay? And that kind of that fear and ignorance. That kind of stuff kills millions of dogs every year, doesn't it? Right? Millions of dogs every year. How many of you guys would love to be working with your local shelters but can't? Yeah. I do, but damn, it's taken a long time. It's taken a lot of work. It's taken a lot of stuff to be able to prove to them that I'm not abusive. I'm not trying to hurt animals. So <coughs> with Tina, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> I've been smoking too much. I gotta cut back to a pack of eight. <laughs> um, so with Tina, um, I got her in July of 2010. Took about a year, okay? Um, but she came to me, no problem. Great, wonderful. I had her for about a month. What I did with her is I was working solely on the halty, um, and also I was doing socials with her. Okay, I was bringing her into my socials, but most of the work that I was doing was on the halty. So we have big adoption events near us where it's about three. 400 dogs there. So Tina, after a little bit of working with her, and I could have done this probably after about a week of working with her, but I had her for a month before the adoption. So I take her to the adoption event because she's ready for what I like to call challenge, which means that, hey, I'm going to show that she can actually be calm and quiet and comfortable around a lot of crazy, a lot of dogs, and not be nuts. Okay. So what I did is I take her to the adoption event. I'm walking her through, and she just looks like a rock star, right? She's walking around. So where do you think the first place I go is? Yep, right by best friends. <laughs> okay, and I'm walking, and you know I don't say anything. I'm just walking, and this was the picture from that day. I'm serious. This is a picture from this day. So I'm walking her, and I just casually stroll by, you know, and everyone's kind of looking because they're like, "Wow, that dog actually isn't pulling that person." <laughs> the one dog out of three or four hundred. So, <laughs> so she. I just walk by. Finally, I hear out of the corner of my, you know, of the corner of my ear. <laughs> I hear out of from my ear. I hear, "Oh my God, is that Tina?" And I just turn on like, "Damn straight, you know it." <laughs> You know, and I just walk on. Um, but no, I talked to them, and I, you know, they couldn't believe that it was her because first and foremost, she looked different. Because her mental capacity for her being able to hang out with other dogs, her whole demeanor was completely different. She was calm. She was comfortable. She didn't look beaten. She didn't look abused. 
okay? That was her. That was pretty much about eh, maybe five minutes after that happened, okay? So Tina, she was actually adopted out in December of that same year, um, which was awesome. Do you guys know why she was adopted, why the guy chose her? She want great on a leash. How many people want that? God, let's start listening. Let's give them what they want. So yeah, she walks great on a leash. So, um, so he took her home, and that was in December of 2010. Aw, that was last week. <laughs> Happy tale. Unlike the cover of my book, the spelling error was intentional here. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so this really is a nice, uh, a nice happy tale for me. Um, she's pushing almost 14 years old now. So that is, that is a very happy story. I love her. Um, she was a really good one just because of the fact that I really could, um, well, because I really had to be careful of what I was doing, right? Not that I would have, I actually had to sign a contract saying I wouldn't use certain tools. You know, I wouldn't use a prong collar, I wouldn't use an e-collar. Um, I had to sign a contract, and then they watched everything that I did with Tina. Um, if you guys are familiar with some of the people that were on the show uh, from Dogtown, a lot of those guys were coming to my socials um, to watch me work with Tina um, in those socials. And she was living with me, she was living in my home um, with my six other dogs at the time, also my cat. She became very social with all of them, um, and to this day, she's an amazing, amazing dog. So I'll be sad when she, uh, when she passes on. Um, so all of that, just so you guys know, all of that happened because of the halty. You know, all of that happened because of the halty. Also, it brought me back in the realm of best friends because now they go, wow, that might be a good tool. Then they had me start going down and teaching workshops to their staff about how to use the halty. Okay, because they could see the effectiveness of it and how we could kind of utilize it and how they could utilize it in a better way. Also, Best Friends Now helps us to pay even the light bill in our building because we take care of a lot of their dogs and they come for socials um, and daycare and stuff at our facility um, from the, through the northern office. So we are, we're back together again. <laughs> okay, which is good, which I could have dropped that like a hot potato, but you know, it, uh, sometimes perseverance pays off, which is very good. <coughs> oh, geez, don't do that. Okay, so let's talk about it. How do dogs learn? You guys are freaking dog trainers. You better have some sort of clue. <laughs> How do dogs learn? Repetition. Shaping. Consistency. Pressure. Thank you. Associations. Yeah. Yeah. There is a lot of ways that dogs learn, right? Um, the ones that I have found to be more effective, um, you know, how many times have you guys heard, my dog never listens? <laughs> oh man, my dog never listens. <laughs> sit, sit, Fluffy, sit! This, I hear this, I hear this in our front office almost every day. Dina's office is right there, and I swear to God, every time somebody comes in, sit, 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 well. No kidding, Fluffy ain't gonna listen to that. Nag, 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 okay? Um, but dogs are master communicators, so it's kind of, you know, who really isn't listening, right? Um, so one of the ways that I um, talk about how dogs learn is through what I call contact pressure. Yeah, this is Odin's butt on my dog Samson's head, <laughs> okay? Um, so contact pressure, basically what contact pressure is, is it's anything that's touching the dog, okay? Um, whether it's the groomer, whether it's this little guy hugging, um, whether it's Odin sitting on Samson's head, whether it's the leash, whether it's the vet, okay? It's anything that touches, okay? The first experiences of contact pressure for dogs comes from mom and litter mates, right? That's how they're learning. Pressure on, pressure off, touch, touch, touch. Okay, this is one of the big ways that they learn. Um, realistically, when we aren't paying attention to some of these how dogs learn and deal with different pressures, this is how they can pick up very bad habits, and we'll talk about how that kind of happens. Um, the other type of pressure is what I like to call distance pressure. Okay, and this is terminology that I came up with because there were other terms that I was using, but it was really kind of hard um, to get my clientele to understand the, the terminology, right? So I kind of made it very simple. Contact means touching. Distance means there's a gap between the handler and the dog. So this is simply eye contact and body language. Dog looks like it's about to melt into the ground there. <laughs> okay, does this make sense? You guys got this all? Okay. We're hoping to do hands-on, so that's why I'm gonna try and bust through this. So, so, dogs learn and teach 
using contact and distance pressure. Right? Do they teach each other? Of course, right? And they're speaking a language. This is a language that they speak. So by using their naturally ingrained instincts, we can better communicate, right? On their level. Their level is not sit, down, stay, here's a treat, fluffy, stop it, don't, eh, okay? That is not their naturally ingrained instincts. This stuff is. That's why the tools and techniques I'm going to talk to you about today it can be so effective, okay? Um, let's talk about one of the most primal activities you can do with your dog. What is it? Bing. Walking. 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 Don't make me sing because I will. Okay. Look at all these pictures. Drives me crazy. I cannot find <laughs> or couldn't find with light looking, um, a picture of a dog not pulling, right? A picture of a dog not pulling on a leash. So this is basically controlling the body over the mind, right? I know they all look so happy. Oh, this is so <laughs> we love salad. Ew, gross. Um, but what do we do when a dog is bad on the leash? What's that? Correct them. Pull back. We pull back. What else do we do as trainers? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. What about we collar up? We harness up. We leash up, right? We get more corrective, okay? And this, ah, man, this just drives me a little bit crazy because this has become such the norm in our society, right? This has become such the norm in our society and it's become so difficult since losing sight of how they actually learn. Isn't this probably like 90% of the calls you get? I know it's us. And it's not just the calls we get, it's the reactivity and the associations that go along with having a dog horribly walk on a leash, okay? So, can you think of anything else? Any other type of animals we lead and how we walk with them? Horses. Horses, oh, good one. Does anybody know me well enough to know what else? <laughs> <laughs> So then I talk about walking everything else, okay? Um, so I don't know why it becomes so hated with dogs as far as, you know, working with a head halter because quadrupeds for thousands upon thousands of years, every time they've been handled by humans have been led by head control, okay? But I think because it's dogs, it's a little different. Uh, this is what a pack walk looks like at my house. Goat, dog, dog, mini cattle, dog, dog, <laughs> okay? So this is always fun when I have students come out. It's a really good time. But look at this little guy. I mean, this guy, you know, what's he, 10? I don't know. But that's a 2,000-pound animal. Do you think he's physically restraining that animal? And where are they walking when they're walking them? And is there a ton of pressure on there? No. It's nice and loose, right? This guy, my, uh, that's my Texas Longhorn, for those of you guys who don't know me well enough. Um, that's my Texas Longhorn. He weighs now about 1,200 pounds, and he has about a six-foot horn span. If he didn't want to walk with me, that could be trouble. <laughs> We're still having our conversations. Um, but yeah, everything else. So we talk about how this is actually controlling the mind over the body. Now we're looking to reverse that, correct? 90% is the mind and 10% is body. So being able to just use slight pressure to be able to work with these. What do dogs do under pressure? Fight or flight. That's two options. What else? Avoid and accept. Oh, dang, you guys are good. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. So four responses to pressure. Flight, fight, avoid, accept. Simple enough. Simple enough. And this is always going to be a dog's response to any new situation. If you guys as dog trainers can start to recognize what they're doing, this could be real helpful. I'll tell you, one of the things that happens, though, is we get down to avoid, and we stop there. What happens when you have a dog who's dog reactive? We get them to stop looking at the dog. Do we ever get them to get along with other dogs? Not always, 
right? Not always. A lot of times we stop at avoidance. I can't tell you how many pictures, and I'm sure you've seen them too, is two dogs sitting next to each other that have at one point wanted to kill each other. Oh, they're fixed. That's still avoidance, okay? You can have a dog staring directly at you practicing avoidance. Does that make sense? I'll show you a video <laughs> if it doesn't, okay? And we probably, um, we might get that happening today when we work with some of the dogs, okay? Um, what this looks like when we're working with head halters, flight, at the beginning, they have no flight option. They may practice it, but it'll be on the end of the leash. So they definitely can't usually use that flight option when we first start with this. Fight, fight on a head halter. It can happen with any tool, you guys. I'm not just gonna be talking about head halters. This actually will apply to any tool that you use, okay? Fight can happen on the prong, on the slip lead, um, on a harness. It can happen on any tool. With the head halter, a lot of times what it looks like, it might be pawing at it, it might be tossing their head, it might be alligator rolling, okay? And we're gonna show you hopefully how to work through that today. Um, Cause that also, with the head halter, that's when people go, I tried it, my dog hates it. <laughs> and then I put it back on their dog and five minutes later their dog is walking nicely next to them. <laughs> Your dog loves it now. Um, so sometimes they don't always see that you kind of have to go through these responses to get down to this acceptance. So they don't necessarily always understand the process to get down to, you know, to this part. So it's kind of working through all of those and we'll show you how that, uh, how that works out. Um, I usually get the call after the dog starts practicing fight. Does that make sense? That's usually where most of you guys are going to be getting these calls too. So dog bit somebody. Dog attacked a kid, dog is lunging on the leash. Um, and unfortunately, without our help, dogs will rarely learn how to accept on their own. Think of the average pet dog home. Are they teaching acceptance? Not usually. They usually don't know how, right? They don't know how to get the dog to that state of mind. They're teaching a lot of excitement, a lot of excitement. Um, fight, flight, avoid. Think of kind of some of your nervous shy dogs. One of the videos I'm going to show you is kind of a nervous shy dog. Um, as a young dog, maybe they avoid, avoid, avoid forever, but you still got that five-year-old kid that won't get out of their face. And then at you know, eight months, the kid gets bit in the face. They go, it came out of nowhere. <laughs> no, it didn't. That dog's been practicing avoidance. Once again, who's not listening, right? Who's not listening? So um, let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Aww, this was their adoption photo. <laughs> what do you guys see? Do you think this dog stayed in this home? No. Yeah, this dog did way more than not stay in this home. This dog actually ended up biting three people in the home, including this little girl to the face. Um, and this is a dog um, that had practiced avoidance for so long. So this dog here, what is this dog practicing? Avoidance, yeah. Um, they, this dog was at the shelter. This was the adoption photo that I was sent after the dog had ended up back in the shelter. Um, Hannah and I actually went and did the eval with this dog. Um, and I said, this is going to be real tough because um, the dog had been practicing um, avoidance and fight for so long. And once the dog got comfortable, fight became the only answer. Fight was the only answer. The dog could not see that there was any potential that there was any potential that anything else was gonna work, but I just have to bite you to get you out of my space and out of my face, okay? Um, so this dog did end up going to another trainer um, for about six to eight months, um, and the dog was eventually euthanized um, after that. But you know, it, it had every opportunity in the world, but sometimes they're just so deep into that that they've practiced it for so long, um, it becomes very difficult. Um, but what I wanna talk to you guys about today is how you know, we can utilize some of these tools and how we can change what what we're doing with dogs so that we can get to them before they get to this point or even when they get to this point that we have other options for them and we teach them that acceptance is an option they don't know that okay they don't know that and in our environment with them they don't use it so using dogs natural ingrained instincts this is how I like to work with dogs Okay, and honestly you guys, it doesn't matter the tool that I'm using. I like to be on the dog's level when I'm working with them, okay? So this is my German Shepherd, Kai. Um, I lost her in the divorce. 
I was sad about that. I was not sad about the ex-husband. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is my dog, Kai. And this little guy that came in, his name is Dozer. Dozer had gotten kicked out of about six daycares. <laughs> okay. He was very high energy, well, at least when he would first start. Very high energy. And what that always led to was him getting into fights. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. It always led to him getting into fights. So this was actually at one of our socials, um, and I've been working with Dozer a little bit, um, but he was being a little bit much this day. So what happens is, here comes Kai. Hey, chill out, buddy. Right? She puts her mouth right over his, and what does he do? Yeah, chilled out. What does she do? Oh. <laughs> okay. What does that tell him? Yeah, chill out. You're good. And so what he's doing here is he's going into um, what we call this kind of submissive posture, right? You guys have all heard that term, um, but submissive posture. So he goes into this position. Is she asking him to roll over onto his back? No. Did she need to? No. Why not? Yeah, she got the point here. Right? I don't need to go overboard with that. In all of our training, I always want to use the lightest form of submissive posture. So there's this one. There's rolling over and also laying down. Okay? So sitting, laying down, rolling over. When I'm working with a fearful dog, if I have them only doing this, their confidence skyrockets. It's amazing how quickly their confidence goes up because I'm releasing pressure. When they give me this such a light form of submission, they go, oh. That's all? That's all you wanted? You're not going to keep applying pressure to me? OK, cool. We can be friends. <laughs> all right? OK. So, um, so let's talk about how we can actually use these tools. Um, and I want to start by talking about um, probably one of the most hated tools in dog training. You guys familiar with this one? OK, because it's not this. It's head halters. OK? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's head halters. OK? Yeah, this is what's called a force collar. Janet, wherever you are, thank you for these. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, these are called force collars. Uh, head halters are way more hated. <laughs> okay, um, if you guys want to touch these later, you can. They're pretty impressive. Um, so basically, head halters. Um, why they're so hated? They're hated on both sides, not just both sides, all sides, right? Pure positive trainers hate them because they think they're causing neck damage, right? Oh my god, the dog's neck. Da, da, da. Yeah, if you're letting the dog yank out in front of you and you're yanking its head back every time, I don't care what tool you're using, you're going to cause damage somewhere. Okay? That's not how we train it. So that's where training comes in. Um, hated by balance trainers. Balance trainers. Hated by balance trainers because I can do that on a prong collar. Okay? Also, because most people see this as a management tool, not a training tool. Does that make sense? Training, training tools and training is meant to change the dog's mind. Management is just barely holding the body. So if I'm using this tool to change the dog's mind, it's training. It's not necessarily management. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about these because you might see some of the differences here. This actually, up in the top right, that is a tool called the Holt. Um, it actually looks very similar to the Halty, but it has a little locking piece at the bottom. Um, when I get these in, I bust off that locking piece because I don't like it. Okay? You see how there's a lot of structure in the face there. The dog can completely open its mouth. It kind of sits forward. Um, the Holt and the Halty are the, usually the tools that we start most dogs with um, just because it creates, um, it, it just gives the pressure on and pressure off very, very nicely. Okay? Um, this one up here, this is a gentle leader. It's not my favorite. It does have its place, but can you guys tell me why I might not like that one? Yeah, never releases pressure. That's not fair. That's not fair, right? They can get to this, but it, mostly if I'm going to use a gentle leader, it would only be for head control. It would only be for head control. I wouldn't be using it to try and create this pressure on and pressure off uh, scenario. Also, there's no safety on it which terrifies me. I don't like anything without a safety, OK? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I don't like anything without safety. Um, this is our leash, the Canine Lifeline Transitional Leash. <clears throat> and this is actually the little version of it here. 
Um, the nice thing about this, um, head halters, when I, I went and did a presentation for an AKC, wasn't it an AKC something, it was like the weirdest presentation I ever did, because they hated me from like the second I walked in, I was like, what am I even doing here? And then I started talking about head halters, and I started talking about halters, they're like, oh, we hate it, boo, boo, boo. And then I showed them the transitional, they bought like 150 of them, <laughs> right? Well, because what they could see is that the tool came from the back of the head, you know, so their main concern was the fact that it came from the bottom of the head. Which, you know, for me and the way that I work with it, I don't care where this comes from. Um, and there are good and bad for each tool. Okay, there's definitely good and bad for each tool. Um, so let's talk about our next uh, torture device. <laughs> Does anyone believe this actually happened in a training session? Okay, thank you. Um, so this is, you know, basically the epitome of propaganda. Obviously, this did not happen in a training session, right? Um, this is abuse. This is neglect. This is somebody that just left the collar on for a long time. Um, but just speaking of prong collars, through this process, and you guys, I'm going to walk you through kind of these five steps, it's the same concepts, pressure on and pressure off. And I still work with a prong collar in the exact same way that I work with the head halter. Gentle pressure up. Once you move into that submissive posture down. <laughs> Don't make me dance. I'm going to dance. I'm going to sing. OK. But once you get that submissive posture, you're releasing pressure all the same, OK? Um, so prong collars, that's another option. Um, what is the second most hated tool in dog training? Yeah, you guys all know that one well. Damn, those guys are rocking out. I need better music. Damn. Okay. Shock collars. Zap. Okay. So shock collars. Um, if you're calling it a shock collar, you guys, you shouldn't be using it. Okay? Because it will be abusive in your hands. <laughs> All right? Um, but the same thing. This is, um, does give touch. So this is also a form of contact pressure. But it's at a distance. Right? So you have touch at a distance. Um, it gives touch and contact pressure. But it doesn't give guidance or direction. Does that make sense? So even, obviously, when you're conditioning this, I do this differently um, than I do these five steps. Okay? Usually we're doing a lot of stuff on the long line. Um, but yeah, this, the, the shock collar is one of the different, uh, different ones. But you guys get to hear that all the time. But it's a lot of the same concept, you guys. This still creates pressure on and pressure off. It's just a different feeling and a different sensation to create this pressure on and pressure off. Um, so really, what is one of the most, probably, well, the way I perceive it, one of the most ineffective but most popular tools out there? Yeah, harness. Yeah. But it's so gentle. <laughs> So they're made for pulling and tracking. This typically is more of a management tool than a training tool. Um, I have used several harnesses as a training tool, um, but I still am grasping onto the same concepts as I'm using the pressure on and pressure off. Um, we have a South African borble uh, that comes into us that had um, wobblers. So he couldn't have anything on his neck. You know, he had all the gold stuff going on. So that was a big dog that needed to be worked with on the harness. So there are reasons out there for everything. Um, but to me, this is one that just gets put out there so much. Um, and yeah, it's just, it really is ends up being a lot more management. It is all of those pictures that you guys are seeing up there of people just getting dragged around. Um, I don't mind if I see somebody, you know, somebody's dog on a harness and the thing's walking next to them. But when I see them, you know, I'm expecting that they're tracking. <laughs> okay, go find it, Fluffy. <laughs> all right. So it doesn't do much for the relationship of the dog either. Let's just say that. OK, so if you guys were at my presentation two years ago, um, I put together some awesome flow charts. Anybody? Anybody remember awesome flow charts? Yeah, thank you. OK. Um, I also am a strong believer that uh, PowerPoint presentations are nothing without bullet points. Um, so let's talk about these five steps to a canine lifeline. And ideally, I'm going to walk through all these. I'm going to show some video, and then we're going to do some hands on. OK? Um, yay, hands on. <laughs> so five steps to a canine lifeline. Teach the tool. And I don't care what tool it is. And you guys can take pictures of these. Um, of course, I'd like it if you bought the book, too. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, yeah, though it's sold out. Actually, we're getting more, by the way. Um, and it's real good. If you guys didn't hear that, the cover got misspelled. The cover got misspelled, so yeah, so. Real good, it's a collector's edition now. Um, so teach the tool, uh, move forward together, so walking. Create fixed space, I'll talk about what fixed space is. Creating unfixed space, talk about what that is, and challenge. OK, 
Okay? It's that simple, you guys. And this is a method and model that I'd used for years and years and years. Um, a couple years ago, I went out um, with Ian Grant. I went out and did a workshop uh, for Burton Snowboards for their nonprofit called Chill. Um, I know I see a lot of you guys have been out there with me. Um, and I actually had to put something tangible. So this is how I came up with kind of these five steps. And it's been working amazing ever since because you really have, you know, these five steps. And I'm not saying you've got to live, die, and love all of this, but when for some of you newer trainers too who don't necessarily have your style together, I'm telling you, this is a great way to go. Use it. You know, if you have questions, contact me. I never sleep. <laughs> who has who has sent me a message anytime after midnight and I've immediately answered? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's talk about step one. So teach the tool. This does not require a lot of moving, okay? You can be working in an area of just the size of this stage, okay? So step one, teach the tool. Condition the dog in an area of little to no distraction of the tool. Why? I know it sounds simple, but why? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to have a whole bunch of distractions. I want to be able the dog just to focus. I don't really want to have a, a big fight with the dog. The dog's already going to be struggling with the tool. Right? So I, the tool and the concept. So if I have all these stimulus around, I'm probably going to be pushing them a little bit further than I want to, okay? Um, patience is always your best tool. This is where I think a lot of trainers struggle. We want it now, 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 now. Yesterday. <laughs> now <laughs> okay so we always I want you to think about being patient and you'll see sometimes this is like watching paint dry um, but it's because we're taking time to ingrain what we're doing with the dog okay really we want it to sink in really well using contact pressure so a leash and I don't care if it's the halty a slip lead a prong collar the transitional I don't care but using contact pressure until the dog lowers its body posture into a sitting position Okay, so I'm simply holding just enough pressure to get the dog to think about it and to think, what do I have to do to get this pressure to go away? Oh, boom, pressure goes away. Simple enough. If I have to stand there for five minutes, great. That five minutes is part of the training process. All right? So all of this happens before I'm ever moving forward. <laughs> At this point, you're working through flight and fight. So flight, I'm working through it because the dog's on leash. Okay, so even if I have a dog who's fearful, I've worked with a lot of feral dogs, even if I have a dog who's fearful and really practicing flight, I can use the leash pressure to work them through that. And fight, so fight, I already explained with this what it looks like, you may see that today. So the pawing, jumping up, rolling over, and you may see that with a slip lead, right? You may see that with a prong collar. You may see it with a chain collar. You know, you see a dog, they'll come up the leash at you, okay? I don't get that much though. I don't get that much. Usually when I'm working with a head halter, um, I did a, I quit working with muzzles a lot because I got so effective with the halty. I, I mean, I'm like a wizard with it. And my timing, when your timing's really good, you don't need it. You know, not to say that I don't recommend that you use it because you can put a muzzle on over it and you can put a muzzle on under it. Okay, so you can use this tool very safely to really help to communicate with the dog, but I got really good at working through the fight part with the dog. Um, at this step, you learn a lot about the dog. I learn if Fluffy is a spoiled little brat. Oh man, I lost my opportunity to say bitch. <laughs> and I can say it because it's a female dog wolf or fox. Okay, so now you know that, um, you know, you know that if, Fluff, if Fluffy has been put on a pedestal, you're probably going to get a lot more fight right? If you have a good relationship with your dog, this has a tendency to go very quickly, right? Where the dog goes, oh, I trust you. Okay, I get it, all right? Um, a dog who's more dominant, a dog who really has been on a pedestal for many, many years, the fight can be immense. Um, very dominant dogs, they're not common, you guys. They really aren't common. A lot of people say, oh, my dog's dominant. They're not that common, okay? Um, but you will see this, I mean, you may end up in this step for anywhere from a minute to 30, okay? 30 minutes. But guess what? That's 30 minutes of saying, hey, we're just going to learn how to hang out here. I like to call this the coffee shop mentality. How many other of your clients would like to take their dog to a restaurant and have their dog lay down with them? Hang out with them calmly. Even talk to somebody while the dog's on leash instead of doing this. Ugh. Okay, so this part is when we work through all of that. So moving forward only happens once the dog is calm. 
Doesn't have to be 100% calm, but the dog needs to start learning how to practice impulse control. Sitting down, hanging out, having a nice loose leash. I'm not having to force them to stay in this position. They're having to think through the whole process themselves of, hey, let's just hang out, okay? This is so important, you guys. That's why it's in red, <laughs> okay? If you can't get a dog to sit next to you on a loose leash, you will never get the dog to walk with you on one. Simple. Is that mind blowing? That's why you come to these things, right? Are you guys learning anything? Yeah. Okay. That's, I have to say that uh, for those of you guys who have been around Caesar a lot, I know Grace is here today too. For those of you guys who have been around Caesar a lot, the one thing he always says to me, or had said a lot, is, What did you learn today? God damn it. Man, I always had one in the chamber. <laughs> like for when he would ask that, like I'd be like, okay, I learned this, I learned this, I learned this. So, so I always like to ask that because it's a really good question. You know, what'd you learn? Or have you learned something? Okay, so step two, moving forward together. So now this is moving forward on a loose leash. This can happen pretty quickly. So once you get the dog kind of hanging out next to you, you're gonna be pretty patient. Then you're gonna start moving forward. You may make it one step. You may make it 10. You may go like this and go, oh, <laughs> okay, and move back into that step one. So at this point, we're working through avoidance towards acceptance. And what this means, and you'll see it in the video, um, avoidance, this is when I'm always joking with the client when their dogs do it, because I always say, this is the part where it looks like I beat your dog. Okay? This is the part where the dog has their head turned, it's low, they look super depressed, okay? I swear I didn't feed your dog. Um, but that's what avoidance looks like. As you keep working through this step two, what'll start to happen, and you, for you guys that work a lot on the e-collar, this is when you start seeing a lot of those check-ins. If you're doing a lot of e-collar work, this is very similar, okay? So when you start moving, the dog will kind of do this. They'll be moving with you, and they're working with you, but then they start giving you these check-ins. You know, just these little sideways eye glances, okay? They just start looking up. And I'll show you in the video that we have, and hopefully we'll see it a lot today with these guys. Um, but that's what we're looking to get to is acceptance. So the avoidance looks like they're beat. The acceptance, whew, it just looks like they've let it all go. Not in like a bad way, like after somebody gets married, but, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they just let it all go, okay? Um, so, you know, you can really kind of see the difference. Remember when I said that they couldn't recognize Tina? They literally could not recognize Tina because her body tone was different. Her eyes were softer. Her muscle tone was different, okay? So that's when you can see that they just go, whew, they shake it all off. Okay, and you'll see in the video, probably hopefully see some of that today too, but this can take a while. This can take a while. This can definitely take, I mean, some dogs will give it to you right away. Some dogs it'll take a couple days. Some dogs it'll take a couple weeks. Okay, and your more difficult dogs, those are the ones that'll take a lot longer. So only match the dog's intensity um, when using leash pressure. Why the hell would I want to use more pressure than is needed? I wouldn't. Sometimes it's instinct, yes, but it's not good instinct, right? If, if it's instinct for us, and it is, you know, we talked about it, um, and when I have students that come and train with me, we do talk a lot about um, being reactive, right? Like you react, like the dog blows up, and what's the first thing we do? Wah! <laughs> Shit. Do you think, <laughs> sorry, do you think it's going to calm the dog down for that? No, it's not going to calm the dog down. It never calms the dog down when you react to being reactive. You're just adding more energy into that situation. If the dog reacts and you just slightly hold up pressure on the leash, they go, oh, okay. Might take a little while for them to calm down, but they'll get it, okay? Um, always transferring to lighter pressure, okay? So I may need to use a little bit more pressure at the beginning, but ideally I want to start not having to use pressure at all. One of the other big complaints about the halty gentle leader head halter, what is it? Oh God, it's up in the eye. Oh, it's up in the eye. Yeah, it's up in the eye for like the first five minutes of training and then it's not a big deal, right? Then it's like, oh, pressure free, okay? So it is just a training tool to be able to get the dog to the right mindset, okay? Using those naturally ingrained pressure points, right? Pressure point across the bridge of the nose. Um, always release pressure when the dog is doing it correctly. Do you guys know how hard that is to get people to do? Oh, relax, relax, relax. 
Yeah, it's really hard to get people to do that. So, um, so I always, you know, I always say relax, and then they like drop the leash on the floor. So, <coughs> excuse me. So that's a big one, always releasing pressure when the dog is doing it correctly. Um, these are options. Um, pop, stop, or change direction when feeling pressure. Help the dog move into a pressure-free zone. So as I'm walking, I want to be able to have this area, you know, and for me, you guys, I'm a, I'm a pet dog girl, okay? I'm a, I'm a difficult dog kind of girl. I'm not looking for a perfect heel. All right, I'm looking for the dog to not pull on the leash and just hang out with me right here. So as I'm walking, I want the dog to be in this pressure-free zone. All right, so options I have, pop, which for me is just a simple pop to the side, okay? I'm not pulling back. This is where a lot of people get a little confused with the halty, is that they are always using the pulling back. I am a, I will, I, okay, I use whips in training and it's to hit people on the hand when they're doing that. You guys know who you are, for those of you guys who have been out training with me. You know, the pulling back, if, if my hand drops behind my hip, I'm telling that dog to move forward, right? I'm giving that oppositional pressure to say, go forward. So if I'm pulling back, I'm not doing any favors. So when I'm doing this pop, and we'll demonstrate it, you guys are going to love our technology here later. Um, but when I'm doing that pop, I literally drop my hand forward to the dog's head, pop to the side, and the dog will drop back. Okay, we'll get a chance to demonstrate that. Stop. The stopping is moving into that sitting position. Okay, that is, that is, that means the most to the dog. Okay, do you guys know that it, why it means the most to the dog, the difference between the sitting and moving into a submissive posture? It's a change, right? It's a lowering of status. It's not just, give me that treat, woman, right? It's a change of status. So when I'm dealing with a dog who can be a little bit more difficult or has been put on a pedestal, they don't want to put their butt to the ground. Because they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We don't have this relationship, right? So it's, it, it's different. It's definitely different. OK. Um, so you can't force acceptance. Good luck. <laughs> okay, you see this a lot, you guys. You'll see it a lot, especially when um, we start doing this and you get into the position where the dog is avoiding, right? A lot of people want to pull the head or put food up to their face. Watch me, watch me. Is that acceptance? If a dog is staring at me because I have food on my eyeball, is that acceptance? <laughs> what? Are you kidding? That's not? Man, I've been doing this wrong all these years. <laughs> Just kidding. So yeah, you can't force acceptance. So people do try and, you know, as a dog is trying to avoid, people try and pull the head up to force the dog to look at you. Just because a dog is looking at you does not mean they're in an accepting state of mind, okay? But when the dog starts to make those choices on their own, where they're moving from this avoidance into, what's up? <laughs> Yo, what's up? Yeah, this is cool. You're all right. You're releasing pressure at all the right times. I think we got this, okay? So through this, and these steps, I'm basically teaching the dog that I understand. I understand your language, and I'm going to talk to you in your language instead of expecting you to come up to my crazy body language. Fluffy, fluffy, fluffy. OK? I'm asking for just a little bit more, but on your level. This is why dogs fall into this so easily, though, too, is because with obedience, that's a lot of made by man using our words and our crazy body language. All of this stuff behavior is working on the dog's level. It's a lot easier to come down to the dog's level than expect them to come up to ours, okay? So step three, create fixed space. So fixed space, it's a bed, it's a bed, okay? Use distance pressure to move a dog into a submissive posture onto a fixed location like a dog bed, place board, or blanket. Can be anything that gives a dog a visual boundary, okay? Does that make sense? Distance pressure, so eye contact. Eye contact, eye contact, eye contact, okay? Eye contact and body language, getting the dog to move back into the bed. And we do transfer this using the leash, but the dog can't live on the leash its entire life. So these are the steps that we take to start getting the dog to move into those positions without having to use the leash anymore. But we use the leash and the contact pressure to help the dog to understand that we're speaking their language. Okay, so now hopefully they go, oh man, I remember the last time I did this, you release pressure. So now the release of pressure becomes this, instead of this, okay? Moving away, and I will show you all of this. Um, I don't use, I, I'm gonna get eye darts. Um, we don't use verbal commands or release words like stay or okay. Okay. 
Can you guys guess why? Excitement. Excitement. I, my whole program is based around creating calm. Most of the dogs that come into me are overstimulated, overtalked, under-exercised, um, just crazy balls. So when they come into us, I'm trying to teach calm, 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 and quiet because they never get that. I ask clients all the time, what calm activities do you do with your dog? Do you know what their answers are? Huh? Well, he sleeps a lot. But that's not a calm activity to do with your dog. So I don't use release words um, like this because they're not using it either. Dogs aren't telling each other to stay. Okay? They're not telling, okay, you can go. So eye contact and body language. Um, also, I believe that that actually creates almost this slingshot effect. Stay, stay, hold on, grandma's coming through the door. Stay, and then grandma comes through the door. Pew! And you've got a building of this anticipation, okay? Um, so that's why I don't use verbal commands or release words, all right? And okay is in our language a lot, right? We use it every day. So I had a dog we were working with, and he was, um, we were working on this, and I'm talking to the client, and okay came into the conversation, and he bolted to the door, right? He just heard it out of normal conversation and bolted to the door. Um, so at this point with the fixed space, Dog is always expected to remain on the fixed space until the handler returns to calmly give affection and guide off of the area. So this is where we bring in Casey Cover and we bring in the condition relaxation. Man, clients love this because now the dog has worked for it, right? Usually I go through steps one, two, and three in a session. Okay, so now the dog has earned it. Where they go back to the dog, lightening up her body language. Because if I go back to the dog like this, he's going to think he's in trouble. Right? But we lighten up our body language, we go back to the dog, we get down on his level. Now we give a nice, deep massage, calm. I don't go back to the dog and get him all nuts and crazy. Oh, you were such a good puppy, I can't believe you stayed calm for like five minutes, it was great, oh my god. Okay, I think I'm more going to get a massage. I don't want that person massaging me, <laughs> okay? I want the nice, calm massage. Also, at this point, you can do what we like to call a snout to tail assessment. Especially, I'll show you the dog that we have in this video. It's this little Aussie. And for this dog, um, it's kind of fluffy, right? So you might not always see bumps or bruises or maybe areas that might feel a little bit warm. So you don't always see that. So this is a great time to really get your hands on your dog. Um, a lot of times we pet our dogs, but not in a way that we're actually paying attention. It becomes mindless. This actually is part of an activity, okay? And it starts to release a lot of those calm endorphins. So working to transfer concepts from contact pressure to distance pressure because the dog cannot live on the leash. Step four, create unfixed space. Using distance pressure to move a dog into a submissive posture to correct or slow down behaviors. We use this all the time in daycare and boarding. All the time. Dogs are playing a little crazy. Eye contact, body language, we walk into them. They move back and down. Now I move away. At this point in step four, I do not care if the dog gets up. He just has to stop doing what he was doing and he can't go back to doing that, okay? So that's the difference between fixed space and unfixed space, okay? But I can use this pressure to, start be, to stop problem behaviors, barking, jumping, counter surfing, rough play, and other problem behaviors, okay? Because, let's say a dog jumps up on you, eye contact and body language. What would happen if you practice step four with a dog you didn't know? You can do it. Especially a dog with a bite history. Go ahead. Caesar is really good at this. I prefer this route, <laughs> okay? I like to give the dog a little more information so that by the time I get to step four, even with a difficult and aggressive dog, a dog who wanted to bite or kill me, I can now move into their space and they go, this isn't so bad, okay? Because I've set them up for success through the contact pressure, through the leash work. Okay, and this doesn't take long to do this. Okay, always follow through, finish what you start. That's important, because now they have, with both steps three and step four, they have the option of flight. Okay, the option of flight is there. So, I want to be able um, to always follow through, so if they run off, I'll be right behind you. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna follow through, get them into that submissive posture, and then move away, all right? Um, when the dog moves in a lower posture, release with distance pressure. Release distance pressure by walking away, blah, blah, blah. Um, this one teaches a dog that you control the resource of space. 
That is probably the biggest resource that people are not aware of. Space around you, right? Space around you. Space at a distance between dogs, okay? This helps the dog to understand that you control these spaces, not them. All right? Step five, challenge. Take your dog into areas of predictable distractions or set up distractions at home. <laughs> hey, you guys want to come over and have some beers tonight? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorites, okay? So have people come over. Now you can practice, right? Or go work outside of the dog park. Work in areas of predictable distractions, okay? Areas that you know that you can set the dog up for success or that you could move the dog back out of that threshold if you needed to. Practice keeping a calm mind. Oh, yes, clam! <laughs> Fucking Lord. Anyone want this signed? It looks good. It looks good. It's very good. Yeah, this is, this is why I have a different PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, this is actually not the one that I had set up. So, clam mind. So, clam mind. Um, I didn't define that yet, but okay, let's call mind. Um, who's it for? Is it for the dog or the owner? Both, absolutely. Yeah, because your dog will never practice something that you are not. If you are not calm, there is no way in hell your dog will ever be, okay? So this is good practice. Owning dogs can be good therapy for us, right? Because you cannot be out of control when you've got a silly, silly dog. But dog ramps up, you calm down with pressure. And this can be eye contact and body language. This can be leash pressure. We'll show you kind of this stuff. Um, if you're struggling, go back to steps one and two before moving forward, okay? Steps one and two before moving forward. So if I go and work outside the dog park, or let's say when I was taking that dog Tina into that adoption event, I took my time to get there, right? I get the dog out of the car and I already start calming her down. I don't rush her into the event and I don't rush the dog to the fence of the dog park so that I can start working with them. Everything that I do with dogs is working with them. This is a lifestyle, you guys. This is not a yo-yo diet. Training is all day, every day if that makes sense, because it's a lifestyle, right? Um, always take your time to get a good mindset before venturing out into new areas. When things get tough, get patient. It's one of my favorites. Because a lot of times when things get tough, we get pissed, <laughs> right? We get frustrated, we get angry, we get uncomfortable. So when things get tough, get patient. Um, also, I use a lot more patience over pressure. So waiting a dog out is going to mean more than applying more pressure, okay? You can always wait him out. Trust me, you can. You can always wait him out. I mean, I've watched Shauna work with a super nasty dog for 28 minutes to get one submissive posture. 28 minutes. But it worked. And then guess what happened the next day? Yeah, it took like 10, 10 minutes. But he got adopted. This is a dog that we worked with in Taiwan, and he was, oh, he was a handful. Um, so... How are you guys feeling about that? Feeling good? It's making sense? Yeah, good. Everybody feel good. All right. I like it. Hashtag good. How about it? It was good. Okay. So, so now we're going to watch some video. Um, yeah, I kind of, so this whole course of this thing, of this video, took about um, 10, 15 minutes. And so just for the sake of time, you'll see it kind of skip through. There's nothing that was happening in the video that you're, the only thing you're not seeing is just the longer work of it. Um, but you're going to see each one of the stages. And I tried to pick out, in the video, I tried to pick out the changes so that you could see what was happening. Um, so this, what's this guy's name? This, Wesley. This is Wesley. Um, Wesley does not like Hana. So we figured this would be a really good dog to work with. Um, he comes to us for daycare, but he has never done training with us. So we just filmed this on Friday, actually. But every time that she walks through the daycare, because you have to walk through where all the daycare dogs are to get to the training dogs, um, he's barking at her, he's growling at her, he's running. And we've never done training with them, so we never had a reason to because he just comes for daycare. So um, we thought this was a good guy because he gives kind of a good example. We knew that we'd be able to walk him through the whole thing in about 20 minutes. So. Um, so here is our boy Wesley. So people always ask me how we um, start with dogs. This isn't a problem of him pulling on leash, guys. This is a problem of him being insecure, okay? So we start him on the slip lead. 
you know, and this all happened very quickly. I mean, I literally just handed her the leash and she's starting to work with them. Um, so people always ask how we put the halty on. A lot of times we'll put it on just like that. <laughs> you know, we just take our time um, with the slip lead, put the halty on. And so here I'm going to walk you through steps one and steps two. Okay. So she's going to take the slip lead off here, attach the safety. You can see he looks a little concerned. His mouth is closed. And this isn't a super aggressive dog, you guys. I'm telling you, he's just insecure. But this is the kind of dog we see a lot. Okay, avoid. Fight. 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 And this isn't bad fight, but I just, I didn't want you guys to see 20 minutes of fight, okay? Avoid. Is that acceptance? No, what is it? Yeah, he's, he's avoiding, yeah, I mean, he's avoiding. He's staring right at her, and a lot of times this happens with dogs that have had obedience training. Because they go, damn, how do I get out of this? And they stare right at you, okay? But we're looking for a mindset, not just this, okay? So here, patience, right? So she's just holding enough pressure, just the weight of his head. Giving a little snap. She's not saying anything here, mostly we're just having a conversation. Once he puts his butt to the ground, she releases. Avoid. Avoid. But do you notice that she's not pulling the leash up to try and get him to come up? Doesn't mean we won't down the road, but in this context it didn't matter. And we're not looking for perfection here, we're just looking to help him to start understanding the context of what we're doing. This is where people hate it. Oh my god, look, it's in his eye. Ah. Yeah, two seconds of this. Jeez, people, relax, okay? So, holding the weight of his head. When I say patience over pressure, she easily could be pulling the leash up, right? and forcing that dog into a sitting position. I don't want the force, okay? I don't want to force the dog. I want the dog to figure it out. What do I have to do to get the pressure to go away? Puts his butt to the ground, boom. Now, not such strong avoidance, but still avoiding, right? But can you see how the changes are starting to happen? It's ever so slight, you guys. You have to pay attention. It's ever so slight. So now he looks like a freaking show dog, walking around. La, la, la. Look, checking in with her. So now we're in step two, right? He's checking in with her. His mouth is still closed, though. That's one kind of big signal. But he starts to do a lot of licking, right? So here she's stopping. She's not applying pressure. He stopped with her. He's looking at her. He's checking in. He's licking. Hey, woman, I'm no threat to you. Giving a little attention here, saying, yeah, boy, you're on the right track. But that was all very calm. Look at the check-ins. You cannot force that, guys. OK? Hey. <laughs> Mouth open, ears back, soft eyes. He's not checking in with her. He's still kind of working between avoidance and acceptance. Um, moves, you know, kind of into avoidance here. But watch what he did there. Boom. He looked right at her before she moved forward. He's like, oh, okay, cool. Let's go. And look here. His mouth is open. Just kind of using just that gentle pressure. She stops. He stops with her. He's looking right up at her. Sniffing her pants because she smells like 500 dogs. Big check in there. Little check in back with her. And some nice, calm affection here. OK, I'm going to pause this right here. Any questions about that? Yes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, eventually, I like it to mean calm down. So let's say my dogs are messing about, and I do eye contact, and I go, hey, uh-uh. You know? But in this context, sometimes they get a little bit lost. You know, they get a little stuck. So it can be part of just being, um, just helping to draw their attention. Yeah, and then get them to kind of go, oh, oh, what am I doing? And then move them back and down. OK? Good? Yeah. So do you use release commands? What's that? Do you use release commands nope. after? Nope, never. Because. So if you want your dog to stay here, and I'm going to run up there. Uh huh. I do this. <laughs> what do you do? And I walk over there. <laughs> Wait, what did you do? I didn't see what you did. I just eye contact and body language. That's the fixed space and the unfixed space. If okay. I want them to stay in a position, I can be using the fixed space. I could be using the unfixed space, too. Um, but it's, I know it can be sometimes a hard concept to grasp that I'm not using verbal. Um, but hopefully, I have a couple more video that might make it a little more clear. OK, but, keep, but that was a great question. Thank you. OK. All right, so this is step three. This is the fixed space. This is where we get to love them up. Look at that booty.
All right, so here we just walk him onto the bed. We've never done this with him, you guys. He hasn't practiced this, um, so she's just using that slight pressure. Here, once again, we're using the condition relaxation because I want to be able to give, man, I want this dog to have a very positive association with this tool on his face. That every time it goes, it comes off, and he's earned this, and he's worked for it, we're given this nice calm massage. Uh, do not do this with an aggressive dog, <laughs> okay? But you know what, Hana could probably not have done this 15 minutes ago. I guarantee Hana could not have done this 15 minutes ago. He would have been growling, he would have been snapping, he would have been really upset with this because he don't like her. I don't know who doesn't like Hana, but this guy doesn't, okay? So this, everything that we were doing actually led up to the fact that we were able to do this. So now we leave the leash on and he lays down. Okay? We're not saying anything to him. We're just using eye contact and body language. If he went to go get up, eye contact and body language, boom. Moves back and down, we release pressure again. So here, we're gonna set up a little bit more of a distraction. Um, for those of you guys who hang out with us, a couple years ago, we had a fox for training. Yeah, so we have this little thing, this little fox that does that, what does the fox say? Ding, 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 ding. And it dances around. Um, so we use this as a distraction. Watch what happens here. So he's looking at that, but what is he doing? He's looking at Hana. He's like, is this cool? What's up with this thing? Is this all right? Are we cool? What's happening? So he's checking in with her, right? And then watch what happens here. Once he looks at her and he says, okay, you're cool with this? Look, he gives a little lick there. Boom, mouth drops open, big yawn. All right, we're cool with this. And look at this, look at the check-ins here. You guys, this is over 15 minutes, right? And she comes back in, soft body language, very nice. Now we give that nice deep tissue massage. Uh, I let clients do this for as long as they want. Oh yeah, they love it. Actually, they pretend they're gonna love it, and then they do it for like two minutes. They're like, oh God, that's boring, <laughs> okay? Um, this is also a good time to get the client to understand how to put the tool back on. I don't care what tool you're working with, but how to put the tool on, take the tool off, okay? Once a dog gets good at this, I mean, we are, we'll just use just whatever, regular slip leads, or we'll go back to them. So this is a good question about kind of the release command here. So I don't really need the release command here. I go back, I give the massage. He gets up, she's gonna stop him here, calm him back down. And she's gonna use her body language to draw him away. You know, to draw him off the bed. If he was hesitant, I might give a little pat to my leg here. Um, I thought it was really important that he got a chance to say hi to this thing, because I didn't want him to have some weird suspicion about it. So, but he's cool with that. Look, he goes right back in. He's like, oh yeah, that was awesome. And here, she stops. Apply pressure up and release. Big check-in, aww. Cute. <laughs> okay, so this next part, um, this is our daycare, or actually this is our boarding. We have two uh, separate areas for daycare and boarding. Um, so this is our boarding. A lot of people ask us about bringing dogs into social. So this is actually gonna lead into that unfixed space where we use this a lot, okay? Do, 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 lots of doggies. 80 to 90% of the dogs in our daycares and our social and our boarding have at one point been labeled human, dog aggressive, or both, okay? This might look just like a normal daycare. It is more than that, <laughs> okay? Of course, the one dog that's muzzled is the teeny tiny healer. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show you what this looks like. But we use the unfixed space all the time, so we're gonna do that next. And I put a video up um, that didn't necessarily include this guy, but he partook, which was awesome because him and Hannah don't like each other. Every time that she was coming into daycare, he was growling, he was barking, doing all this fun stuff with her. So you can see now he kind of takes off. She's just gonna take the leash off real quick. Um, he's just kind of doing his thing. Everyone's following around. There's my sick dog, Quinn. So she's, he's running off, but look at him. He looks comfortable, right? He'll come back around here. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> where, where are you going? <laughs> okay. All right, so this is nice. So now we're gonna practice the unfixed space. So now I just have her pick some dogs. So this is this young dog, but oh my God, look at how fat he is. Okay. So now I'm just having her walk around the room. This is our foster Maggie. We've had this dog for two and a half years, and she may be getting a home in the next couple weeks. We're so excited. It's a one in a million, I'll tell you. So here she goes after the husky, right? No big deal, but look who pays attention. Who's playing along? Right? And look at him. Isn't that great? 
I had intent, I was gonna show a different video, but it was just so cool that he was playing along. Okay, so now she's working with, um, now going after kind of a little uh, Rottweiler puppy. This one's a little bit more anxious, a little bit more like really riles up the room kind of dog. And so here it goes from distance pressure to contact pressure. So she gives a little bump just to say, hey, I'm right here, eye contact, boom. And when she walks away, we don't care if she gets up. <laughs> drive, drive by sniffing. Okay, so that is all steps one, two, three, and four. Now I'm gonna show you this video. Um, this is what we consider step five. So every Sunday we do a class called Walk the Walk, okay? Um, and this is how our clients can come to us and practice um, creating you know, predictable distraction. Once again, 80 to 90% of the dogs that come to this class um, have been labeled either human, dog aggressive, or both. We do have several dogs in this class that have also killed dogs. And check out our view too. There's a parking lot. So we do a lot of different exercises. Um, I always steal stuff from anyone I meet. So we do uh, like Tunnel of Love, um, things like that. Um, when we first started this class, oh my God, it was a nightmare. We had about 50 dogs show up and they all wanted to kill each other. So now it looks like this. And here's my, uh, one of my employees that was pregnant and just being a space case. I'm like, Allie, get out of the way. Allie, Allie. <laughs> She'll appreciate I showed you guys that. This is on YouTube if you want to watch it again. Um, yeah, but look at how nice this is. There's nobody reacting, nobody blowing up. Um, that little guy there is a little bit of struggling, but you know, not a big deal. That's why they're here, right? And then we take walks. So we just take walks out from our hood. We do some distraction at the beginning. When they come back, we practice step three, the fixed space, and then we do the massage to basically end the class, okay? All right. So that's the end of this portion. Um, I want to do some hands-on. Yeah, <laughs> who's that? Who's that guy? Jason. That is Jason Mesconi walking my mini Scottish Highlander. Isn't that cute? It's not the fool. It's the fool, not the tool. Um, so what we're going to do, um, can I trust you guys to be back here in like two minutes while we get some stuff set up? Do you guys want to stand up for a minute? Okay, go do it, but come back because we're going to do all hands-on stuff. Um, and I would love to get that little bloodhoundy thing. He might be too tired though. Okay. Uh, no, I really have just been kind of asking people randomly here and there um, about their dogs. Um, and we're going to try and get a little techie here. Um, just because I know that you really struggle, it's hard to see. Um, and Hannah just ran to the bathroom. Uh, it can be really hard to see when we're working with a dog. So what we're trying to do is we're just going with our uh, Skype connection here um, so that we can try and put it up on the screen for you guys. Um, so once we start working, but we're going to get a little bit more uh, into it. Um, until Hannah comes back, uh, do you guys have some questions about that? No, not Skype. <laughs> yeah. And make sure we use this mic too. Whoa, that was crazy. Okay, use the mic. There you go. Monica's on it. Hey, Heather. Hi. Uh, yeah, one question I had was uh, just about, uh, you know, when, when going through this process, the five steps, I was curious. Have you ever had dogs that really, really struggle even for a really, really long time? You know, you're doing this for five weeks and they're still moving in and out of, uh, from fight and avoidance and... Is it you working with the dog or is it the client? Uh, both. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we have dogs that struggle and that's kind of where patience comes in handy. Um, we have some dogs, um, you know, I mean, it's taking eight months before they're not reacting to dogs out on the leash. Um, but we're also combining that with our socials um, and the walk the walk class. So they usually will get the, the gist of it. It's that step five the challenge that is usually kind of the hardest. You know, that's where they're really struggling. If you find that you're struggling with that a lot, I'm gonna guess you're maybe moving forward too fast. Does that make sense? So you might wanna stake a little more time into that steps one and step two um, before moving, you know, moving towards challenge. Cause you can do one and two and then start challenging. But a lot of people, just like I said, trainers, a lot of times we wanna move forward way too fast. So, um, so that might be where the dogs are getting, are struggling because they got pushed too fast. So maybe even reiterate and slow it back down. Yeah. Right here, Monica. Um, I was just wondering, what determines whether you were using like leash pressure versus like the snap? Because you were still in the like beginning stages, so why wouldn't you just, why 
would you do a snap instead of just the? Um, ideally, I want the snap to. Where you, where you, I know, shit. All right, ideally I want the snap to represent something different down the road so that I don't have to use the pressure. Does that make sense? So it becomes almost like a lighter, it, it can almost be kind of a marker too to say, hey, that's enough, just chill out, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, ask me later when I have a couple drinks. <laughs> Seriously, you guys, you guys have access to me like this whole weekend and I'm gonna be drinking tonight, tomorrow, and the next night, so. <laughs> It's fun. It's a good time. All right. Hi. Hi. So I guess the thing I'm most curious about is like transferring it to clients and like staff. Yeah. Because I mean, it's like I feel like I understand this and can do it well. And then yes. like trying to teach my staff like how to do it, it's the hardest part. And that is, yeah. It's a struggle. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And you know, and the thing is, are you talking about the handling or just the concepts in general? I mean, I guess the actual handling. Sorry, Monica. I didn't mean that. That's where I use the whip. So I whip the handler. And I'm just like, stop that. Stop doing that. But most... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, well, it takes experience, you guys, right? It takes practice. This is not going to be an easy, easy thing right at the beginning. It's just like driving, right? First, well, I guess they don't do that anymore, right? Hands 10 and 2? Now, are they... Oh, because I heard they do it lower now because of the airbags. Yeah, right? Oh, see, you're all as old as I am. Yes! <laughs> right? So first, when you start driving, at least when I did, it was hands 10 and 2, but now I'm drinking a Red Bull and texting. Right? So, but it takes a little while before you get comfortable with it. With these tools, you guys, I really want you to be able... Come around the front, Petra. I really want you to be able... Um, to practice and don't go out and practice with really difficult dogs practice with your own dogs because your own dogs are going to put up some fight you know put your hands on a lot of dogs don't don't wait until you get that man eater that you're like oh yeah halty is going to be a great tool for this dog okay um so we're going to work with this guy um this was actually and what was your what's your name Cat. cat okay hi cat um i actually asked cat the first or second night i can't remember i'm like man your dog's awesome um, i want to check him out so um she agreed that we could work with him so we're going to do that um we're going to have cat put the halty on he's never had a halter on right nope. okay um, and this you guys sizing this is a size three the sizing on the halty is horrible okay um it's they're they're way too big Okay, so they're way too big, so usually you want to undersize it a little bit. The most important part on the halty is having the back tight. Okay, there you go. Good. So go ahead and take the prong collar off as well. Um, when we start with any tool, you guys, um, I want to take all the other tools off because, and Kat, we may have you handle a little bit here too, but um, just don't be weird and let's, uh, let's see how this goes. Good. Okay. And I have handled dogs. I've handled thousands of dogs in front of clients working with them. Um, this is a guy who's had a lot of obedience. Um, so he's going to probably go into obedience mode fairly quickly, um, which is good. That's kind of one of the reasons I picked him. But usually where they start to fight is when they start to realize it might be something a little bit different. Okay. But this is pretty nice. So now Hannah's just in step one. Can you guys see our video here? Oh, man, it's such crappy quality. I'm sorry. We're trying to get all technical. But watch, now he's starting to sniff and smell. Might be a little more nervous about Petra. Yawning, he's licking. God dang, this is such a beautiful dog. I wouldn't own one, but I think he's real pretty. He's licking. This is a very sensitive dog. Can you guys see why I'm saying he's sensitive? Yeah, very little pressure. And this does have a lot to do with everything that Cat has already done with him, okay? What's he practicing? Avoidance, yeah. So he's kind of starting to go, oh man, I'm not with mom. Um, I'm doing something that's stressing me out. Uh, learning is stressful, you guys. Learning can be very stressful. Very nice. But look at all the licking that he's doing. He's asking for a lot of reassurance. Cat, how old is he? Okay, he's still a baby. So he's asking for a lot of reassurance. But also, this is a pretty strong bred dog. I want him to be very comfortable and confident, okay? So this is a tool for even this guy who's just a little bit insecure. Um, this is a tool that could actually help to build his confidence, right? Because he starts to understand that pressure means to calm down. So now we can transfer that pressure from eye contact and body language into, or from, a little, sorry, it's one of those days, isn't it? Um, we can transfer those, all of these concepts to now even people approaching him. Because he's pretty sensitive even with people approaching him, isn't he? Has he ever snapped at anybody? No, this thing is Okay. Yeah. 
And this is great that Cat has been aware of this, right? And has protected him so that he doesn't feel like that. But this tool could actually help him to build his confidence. Is this, is this making sense? OK, what do you think? I think it's good. I'd like to see if he's used a lot of it, like, uh -huh. see how that transfers. OK. Right. And it does transfer. Everything does transfer. For me, what I like to work with, and I'll tell you, I work with a lot of, um, a lot of dogs that do a lot of competition stuff, but there's one point in competition where they're struggling. Right? Um, so to be able to kind of create this, where we can build their confidence through a different tool, then you put them into a competition, you put them into anything, you can layer a lot of fun stuff on top of that. Okay? Are you guys able to see this at all? He's kind of a dark dog, too. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Oh, uh, can we shove these? Just these two? Yeah. You have a question? How do you, yeah. So I have a lot of pushy dogs. Yep. So I would think that that is then saying, okay, I'll do what you want to do, but I'm still owning you in a way. Is that a mission? To touch? Um, yeah, kind of, you know, and that's one thing that's also controlling resource of space, but I want to be aware that this is a sensitive dog. You know, I'm not necessarily going to let him keep pushing into me. I'm going to sometimes bump him off. But the nice thing is that he was really, it was a nice, easy transfer from mom to Hana, which I thought you had thought that he might struggle a little bit. So this is a nice, easy transfer, right? And look, he's like, oh, mom, oh, mom, what's happening? Yeah, that I probably would start stopping at some point to say, hey, that's enough. And he is practicing kind of this avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. And he is looking at Hana. He's starting to check in with her. But I still don't see it as acceptance, OK? He's got his eyes kind of darting around a little bit. That's avoidance, right? Exactly. It may be different if she wasn't in here. Now what I do, you guys, I used to do a lot of consultations where I was working with the client in front of the client. Um, and that worked out, and I got really good at it. But when I found that I was bringing in my staff and trying to train other trainers, they really struggled with training the dog in front of the client because it was very difficult, especially when you get a dog who goes into crazy fight. When you get a dog who goes into crazy fight and the client's there, I went through all of this before I ever put it on the dog, so they already kind of knew what to expect. But now we do it as a day drop-off, um, at least a day drop-off, sometimes a longer program. But we have them drop-off in the morning. We do about two or three sessions with them, steps one, two, and three. And then we send them home in the afternoon, so they're already conditioned to it. And this guy's had a lot of training. This doesn't necessarily mean, the nice thing is I, I picked him because he did have a lot of training and I didn't want to see too much fight. Um, this is really nice though, it's very transferable. Very good. So Heather, I have a question on the dog that would fight a lot. Okay. Is it here? <coughs> Damn. I'm training a standard school that came from a breeder at five months. Okay, hold on one second. I just want to point something out. So there was that, that no pressure, right? No pressure, she stops. And that has a lot to do with everything that you've done. But look at the difference in his demeanor here too, right? He is in avoidance still. You know, he's in that avoidance. But I have a feeling if we keep working him through this, he is going to get very comfortable with Hana because Hana is being very fair with him. Right? Hana is being very fair. She's releasing pressure at all the right times. She's being very fair. And he's going to start saying, oh, OK, that's cool. Very nice. I love the licking. <laughs> Big yawn. I want to see if he'll drop his mouth open here. You guys see all these calming things that he's doing? Who thinks, well, who recognizes that as stress related? I know some people, yeah, a lot of people see that as stress related. For me, I always see that as the, the moving towards the calm. You know, so yeah, learning is stressful. So if he's doing a lot of this licking and jaw, you know, he's starting to yawn, I'm okay with that, okay? I am okay with that because I see where it's headed. Yes? So would you consider that more of a stress? Yes. Yeah, I would, but some people, that's why I was just asking, some people see it as just stress. And they go, oh my God, look at how stressed the dog is. Stress, learning is stressful. Have you guys felt a little bit stressed in the last couple days? It's stressful. Man, I slept good last night, but it was mostly because I drank a lot the night before. <laughs> I wanted to be prepared for you guys. See, and he might start to be struggling here a little bit because he might start recognizing that this is a little bit different than what he's used to doing, which is the obedience thing. And we see this a lot. Um, we work with, you know, we work with anything from police canines to, you know, high, high obedience dogs um, that will struggle with this. They come in and they start just doing everything, you know, like this, but then about five minutes in, they start doing this. So now you can see Hana is just being patient. Okay, patience over pressure. 
<laughs> Man, he's so cute. Do you see the difference now? Now he's starting to realize something's a little different. Yeah. Now he's thinking. He's like, oh, that was all right, but I'm just not 100% sure. We're going to get mom back in the picture here in just one second, too. Mm -hmm. Damn, I wish our technology was working better. We tried, though, because I know how difficult it is to actually see. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, and I do use prompts, I do use e-collar. Sure, me too. <laughs> so how do you determine mm -hmm. what you're going to use and what's the benefit of this versus prompts versus e-collar? That is a great question. You are really good at the question thing, so that's awesome. <laughs> um, so that was, a, that was a really great question, though, just asking when do we kind of decide what's, you know, what is going to be the best tool. Um, and I will tell you, it's not me that often decides that. Even though I love this tool, it is the feedback from my clients. My clients love this tool. They love it. Who works with the Halti and works, has great feedback from their clients? Thank you. Who learned that from me? <laughs> that was good. Thank you. All right. OK, that was awesome. Um, but that's really nice because that's the one thing that it's not necessarily about me. It's about matching the right tool. And also, most people are coming to me because they're struggling with their dog. And being able to walk their dog is one of those primal things that not only is it good for the dog, but it's good for the people, too. So it's you know literally, this is one of those tools that I've just found the clients just gravitate towards. And when I tell them that a lot of trainers are super opposed to this tool, they go, what? What are you talking about? Like, why? I don't get it. And it doesn't mean that they need to use it forever. Um, the nice thing about our other leash, the transitional leash, is that we can, <clears throat> you can switch that right to the, um, you know, to, the, to the slip lead fairly quickly, and then they're using just the slip lead. This is getting much better. Did you like that? OK, I, I, I heard everyone over here go, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just these little things. I think, Kat, let's get you back in the picture. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I just had to stop because when I see it, I just have to show it. Yeah. Look at how pushy he's being with mom. Damn, hold on. I know this is a good question. OK, but. <laughs> But I want to point something out. You're going you're gonna to have the best answer ever. I want to point something out. OK. OK, but I want to point something out because why is he going into so much fight? No. No. He's saying it's different, and this is not what we've practiced before, Mom. Good. No. No, he's fighting more with her because they have an association. He has zero association with Hana. The association he has with her, he's struggling a little bit with the tool, and he's being pushy. And he is a little bit pushy, though, too, especially with when he's asking for attention. Now it's coming out a little bit more, right? So now he's saying, hell no, Mom. Wait, hold on. This is the question over here. <laughs> OK. And we'll just all have Hana keep working here, so. OK. Is it with that's paw? Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. Is, have you just started? I mean, you can start with just, uh, just slip lead pressure, working with the slip lead a little, too. What's, what's the reason that you want to work with the halty? Just to calm the dog a little more? Or? OK. Just go slow. I mean, that is one thing, uh, Amanda just said it here, is that sometimes when you see a lot of fight, sometimes it's because you're applying too much pressure. OK? And that is, uh, that's very hard for us to do. And you'll, you know, you'll see it here. And that was one of the first things you guys said. It wasn't because she was applying too much pressure. It was the difference, the association of the relationship. OK? So this is what I mean about how you can learn a lot. So what I would do is probably just take time. You can create all the same stuff with the prong collar. You can create all the same stuff with a slip lead. So if you're struggling with that tool, try something different. You can always revisit it, too. OK? And we can talk about it later. I know I'm going to have drinks with you for sure. <laughs> OK, yes? So what is it that you decide to, when you, after you finally uh, relax and to the sit, what makes you decide to start moving again? 
when he's just hanging out there. Like, I don't want to just rush forward. I really want to have him just kind of take it all in. This, this is so great, you guys, because he, I guarantee if she told him to sit, he'd have his ass to the ground, right? He is not moving his butt to the ground because he knows now it's different. He knows it means more. He knows that it means if I put my butt to the ground, I'm lowering my status. Kind of, but he's, he's testing you. This is kind of that, you know, and, I, and trust me, this is, this is no offense at all. My own personal dogs did this, it's just me too. So, um, but it literally is, it's a different tool. So he's going to go through that process, right? So now we talk about all those responses. He's going to fight. You know, he's going to fly. He's, and he tried, right? He was like, oh, hell no, I'm out of here. So he's, he's going to go through all that stuff. He's going to go through the avoidance. So when I have the client come back in, and see how she wants to she wants to hurry this up here. So she's gonna try and release. Good. And you gotta release that eye contact too, girl. <laughs> so now he's back up, pressure up. Good. Hold. What's that? Yes, absolutely. Because now you're still applying pressure. So if I get the dog to put his butt to the ground, but I'm still standing there like this. Yeah. Yep. And also, even your body language is still telling him something, too. You know, so you're trying, like, God damn it, buddy, stop embarrassing me. <laughs> yeah, done. Are you seeing about the same result on a transitional versus a whole team? I mean, I know there's similar yeah. concepts yeah. and release yeah. pressure points. I mean, is it one or the other? How do you decide to start all team pressure? You know, typically that is another great question, but she's still the question winner. Um, good question, though. Thank you, Don. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, we always, well, typically, I, I always, if I say always, I mean like maybe, sometimes never, because um, it's all great in dog training. Um, so typically, we start most of the dogs on the halty, and then we decide where to go from there. Because the transitional, with the transitional, if you get much fight, I mean, they'll just back right out of it. And then now you've got to start all over again. You know, now they've won. Like, check one, dog. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, we typically start most everything on the halty, and then we decide where to go from there. If I have a difficult or reactive dog, that's where I'm going to kind of um, uh, definitely probably stick with the halty. Good. And once he puts his butt down, you're going to just release that pressure and release. Very good. Good. So now just hang out here. This should be for him. What's he practicing right now? Yeah, avoidance. And that's okay. That's all right. So now go ahead and just start walking with him. Good. Try not to be in obedience mode, though. Yeah. Hard, right? <laughs> no, really, how hard is that? When you've practiced something for so long, our muscle memory is saying, yeah. oh, heal. <laughs> right? Where it's just like, no, dude, just be with me. Just be with me. I know somebody had a question over here. Yeah. Would it, would it help to work him on the other side, then? Nope. Doesn't matter. No, and I don't care if he works on the right or the left. Yep, so he's starting to fight more, so now, boom. She's going to stop. Excellent. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, you got all technical up in here. Um, so, a uh, brachycephalic dog, so a dog with a squishy face. I just want to say squishy face. Um, how, how do you use it on a dog with a squishy face? Well, that wasn't the actual question. Hers was way more sciencey. Um, so, dog with a squishy face. This is nice. Now he's starting to check in with you. Okay, and. Sorry, I, I just have to be watching this too. Um, that's where our smaller leash comes in. Um, but if you can't fit it in there, but I like that the transitional, the small one will fit in some of those little uh, crevices, and it literally sits right in there. Um, it's awesome. Um, or if that doesn't work, you can use all of these exact same techniques with a slip lead, with the prong collar, pressure on, pressure off, okay? Um, and why a lot of trainers don't necessarily like this tool, it takes time to condition it. It takes time to condition it, you guys. It takes work. I'm sorry. <laughs> it takes work. This is looking much better, though. You see how he's starting to check in with mom now? He's saying, okay, this isn't so bad. Big lick. He's not being as pushy either, right? Yes. Oh, you raising your hand for somebody else? Oh, okay. What's up? Uh, the, this is kind of, kind of a question. This came to me, but when you see that a dog has fight, awesome. and they're just mm -hmm. No. No. Because why would I want to bring that out? I do want to work through the issues that are happening at the beginning, but I don't want to create conflict. 
I never, well, I'm not going to say never once again, <laughs> black, white, or different. I don't get bit much, okay? I don't get bit much because I don't create a lot of conflict. You know, I don't create a lot of conflict. Everything I do is, you know, my body language is turning away. My pressure is very gentle. So I'm not creating conflict. I'm, usually if there's conflict, it's on the dog's side. You know, the dog's tossing his head. He's having the issue, but I'm just standing there calmly, okay? So that's kind of the, the difference here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, he'll have it, but you'll see it when you take him out for challenge. And then you just go back to steps one and two again. Yep. It'll always come back. Yeah. It'll always come back. Look at this is a highly trained dog, right? Cat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? But this is a highly trained dog, you guys. But it always will come back because now the context is different. So don't be afraid of that, you guys. I think that is another part where trainers are afraid because now they're having to go back to working the client through it, and you have to teach the client how to handle it, okay? So now you're learning something different, right? So it is, it's just like driving a car. You gotta get used to it. Practice with easy dogs, practice with simple dogs. But Kat, what do you think? I like it. I okay. I see how it can be very, very useful. Okay. Exactly, yeah, yeah, so, so you're both a little green, but I love this. I think this is, this is really, really nice for him. Um, and I think this could be, yeah, good timing right there. And you see how tempting it is to just want to hurry this shit up, yes. right? Yeah, because that's what we want, right? Like, we want it now. We want it yesterday. We want it now. So that's where it's like, man, so always think patience over pressure. Take your time. That's why sometimes this looks like paint drying. See, and Hannah's getting all antsy now, too. <laughs> okay, awesome. Very nice. And then release. So here, what I want you to do, because I want to end this on a really nice note, because I do want to try and work with one more dog here. Um, what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you um, take the halty off, and I'm going to have you give a nice, deep massage. Very calm. Very, very calm. There you go. Very good. And as it's coming off of his nose, rub right across the bridge of his nose. Give him attention. See, so now he gets rewarded for that work, right? This was work. This was new for him, OK? And ideally, what I would be doing with him at this point is I would be crating him, OK? I would probably work with him a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, I want to have soak time. So I, I would crate him. I would give him the time to think about it. Then I would take him out again. I guarantee by a second or third session, you probably will see a different dog. Okay. Thank you so much, Kat. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Who else do we got? Do we want to work with this little bloodhound? Yeah. Okay. Um, we got this little puppy here, um, this little bloodhound. <laughs> Damn, did we just pick like the cutest dogs in the whole conference? Yeah, I thought so. Um, we'll see how this goes um, because this is a young dog um, and this dog has been hanging out. Are any of you guys watching this? Yeah. Oh, you are? Okay. All right. Okay, just making sure. I know it's, we really tried because I know how tricky it can be. Um, this is a young dog. Um, he has been out a lot throughout the day, so I don't know how well he's going to do, but let's, uh, let's give it a shot. Oh, what a cutie. And he is uh, seven months old, Laura? Okay. And this was cute. She asked on the IACP page what we thought of um, bringing, you know, if we thought that she should bring her dog, and I was like, I'll work with it. <laughs> so, but it can be difficult having dogs here, you guys. If you guys didn't bring dogs, it's like a whole other world when you do come with a dog, because um, you're trying to rush to get them out to the bathroom, you're trying to get yourself to the bathroom, you're trying to, you know, do all sorts of stuff, so, yeah. Why are you trying and he's going right to the transition? I know you said it's not an aggressive dog. Well, because I just don't. And we typically mostly start, and that was a great question. He was asking why we're not starting any of these guys in the transitional. So here you go, you're going to see some fight. Um, the reason is because if I get this unexpectedly, I'm better prepared with the halty. Yeah, I'm better prepared with the halty, okay? God. So you're going to see some fight. And this guy, just because he has been out a, a lot of the day, he's young, he's seven months old. Um, you're probably going to see a little bit more of this. But this is all good, this is all part of the process. Hannah is going to get real angry here in a second. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Has anyone ever seen Hana angry? No? I haven't either. We travel, we travel all over the world together. It's just, this is, this is uh, she's way better handler than I am now. I usually just talk while she does all the handling. Um, a lot of this started um, when I was pregnant, so uh, I couldn't do most of the handling, so Hana started traveling with me, um, and she did all the handling, and it just worked amazing. So if you guys have an opportunity to work with somebody else and really have that connection where you can do one thing and they're doing another, but you're definitely always on the same page, it works. We've been at some conferences where, and workshops where somebody's handling a dog and both Hana and I like go in at the same time, <laughs> We're like, and then we just look at each other and laugh, like, oh, you saw that too, right? 
Ja. 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 Yes. No. Yeah, you keep the pressure. Keep in mind that it's their conflict, not mine. You know, so it's them, you know, and realistically, the thing that I'm asking for, simply put, I'm asking them to put their butt to the ground. Holy crap. Oh, that's so difficult. So difficult, right? So it's, it's a very simple concept, but for them, it actually means a lot. You know, it means a lot. And especially if they haven't been asked to be accepting, which just like I said, most dogs have never been asked to be accepting. If they haven't been taught how to be accepting over and over again, this becomes very difficult for them. You know, and they, no animal wants to lose their leadership position. And in this context, for him to put his butt to the ground, that's what it means. Okay, yes? So how come at this moment you won't ask for a sit? Because sit and submissive posture are two different things. Okay, sit for a treat looks very different than sit in this context. Okay, sit, physical. Mind is always somewhere else. So if she did say sit right now and he sat, would she not? Yeah, she would, but we wouldn't be getting there. We'd be cheating. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit cheating. Um, so let's think about it. When I ask for a sit, and I see this happen all the time with my clients, they ask for a sit before they go out the door, right? You get a sit, the body is there, but the mind is already out the door, right? So if I'm getting this, oh, that was nice. So avoidance. Okay, um, so with this, I'm getting a more deeper, more naturally ingrained position that is much calmer. So now it is the body and the mind, okay? It doesn't mean that I will not use verbal down the road, but at the very beginning, I want them to learn this way because it's calmer too. It's much calmer. Does that make sense? Is any of this making sense? <laughs> All right, good. This kid is gonna do awesome. Mm -hmm. And I mean the word ever, had a dog that uh, just could not come to acceptance where you had to say this is not the right tool for the dog. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely I have, um, but it's been few and far between. Um, so some have been a lot of fight. This is nice. Look, now he's licking. So you see all that? Who would have gave up in that first section? Yeah, who would have, who would have stopped? Don't lie to yourselves, you guys. Who would have stopped and said, mm, screw this? Yeah, yeah, before you worked with me, you might have, yeah, yeah. So now, oh, look at this guy. See, but look, now he's doing all that same stuff. He's licking, he's yawning, he's avoiding. Now this looks like that we beat him. Look at that face. <laughs> Somebody better be taking pictures. Are you guys taking pictures? Oh my God, take pictures. Oh my God, he's so cute. Okay, so, but, you know, and this was one thing when she was asking about bringing him to conference. I'm like, yeah, bring him. I would love to work with them. Oh, look. Oh, see, and oh, that was so cute. That was so cute. Okay, so what happened there is he felt pressure, and he already learned that pressure means to put my butt to the ground. So he barely felt pressure, and he went to go put his little butt to the ground. Oh, that was so cute. <laughs> this guy looks like we beat him all the time. Look at his face melted off. <laughs> Okay, so this guy, we probably won't get to acceptance in this, but is this making sense for you guys? You see what we're, what we're do you see what we're dealing with here? Okay, good. <laughs> Wait, the struggle is real. Yeah, that's one of my favorite hashtags. <laughs> struggle is real. Okay, perfect. Are you guys liking this? Yes. Excellent, okay, yeah. I see that she's quite often snapping her fingers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm getting a different mindset. So what I'm pairing it with is a different mindset. Um, you know, and I could ask for sit, and I could be getting the same mindset, but usually, just like I said, the dogs that are coming to me are overtalked, overstimulated, overtouched, under-exercised, and usually that word has been completely burnt out for them anyway. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of a passive. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. It kind of depends on the dog. And I will tell you, I love the dog that actually is more fighty than a dog who's more passive. But we will increase pressure in other ways, though, too. Like, we will help the dog out. We'll touch their back end if it's going on too long. But what I really wanted to demonstrate for you guys today is to go slow. Take your time. 
Okay, go slow. But we do increase pressure. We will increase pressure by touching the back end. We will also increase pressure by holding up and then turning our body towards them. Okay? And moving into them. How you guys feeling? Good. Like it? Mm -hmm. so yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Bouncing off the walls. It works, it works amazing. It works amazing. And I will tell you, the more bouncy they are, the faster the response to this. Where they go, oh, wow, okay, cool, thank you. Because usually they'll fight a lot more, but then when you work through the fight, it literally, like, all of a sudden you see that different dog. You see that different dog like Tina. You know, where all of a sudden it really has been opened up. Yeah. Okay, you guys, I do have to wrap it up, um, but I want to check in. Halter haters, how are you feeling? Okay, better? All right, that was you. All right, good. Um, if you guys do have questions, do not hesitate to get a hold of me, uh, especially as I'm drinking. Um, also, you guys, you guys can find me on Facebook. I also, by just Heather Beck, um, also Canine Lifeline. Um, and also, I do have a cattle training page called Balance Bovines. So if you're interested in that, come check it out. It's hilarious. Thank you guys so Let's much. Let's thank Heather Beck.